Hello, everyone, and welcome, welcome everyone. My name is Alessandro Ruggero. I'm the director of the Istituto Italiano di Cultura in, uh, in Toronto. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today this uh, webinar with Thomas Dalla Costa, who is here with us virtually. He's actually at the National Gallery in London in his uh, office at the National Gallery. As you, as you know, this is the, um, <clears throat> one of the um, webinars that has been organized um, within a series, in the framework of a series of webinars uh, by all the Italian culture institutes in North America, in the United States and in Canada, dedicated to Raffaello, to the 500th anniversary of Raffaello's passing. So, as you know, Raffaello, Raffaello, as you say in English, passed away on April 6, 1520, in Rome. So, what we had a large number of events in program for 2020 to celebrate this event, not only in the States and in Canada, but all over, all over the world, uh, carried out by the diplomatic missions and the Italian culture institutes uh, around the world. And of course, due to COVID-19, we had to reshape all the events that we had in program. And uh, here we are. So we decided to, to present this series of webinar and um, to ask prominent scholars uh, around the world, Italians and non-Italians that have dealt and studied um, scholarly uh, the work of Raphael to join us and to present to you, to our public, uh, their, their research. So today we have with us uh, Thomas de la Costa. And Thomas, will, who is a Harry M. Wein <clears throat> Weinrebe Curatorial Fellow at the National Gallery in London, and the, the theme of um, the, today's webinar is uh, on the footstep of the genius, Raphael and Paolo Veronese. And Thomas will explore the relation between uh, Veronese and Raphael. As you know, Ra Ra uh, Raphael died before, so they never had the opportunity to meet. I think Veronese was born uh, later in 1528 in Venice, while um, Ra Raphael died in 1520 in Rome. But the influence, nevertheless, the influence of um, Raphael on Veronese, it's quite um, clear, I would say, and Thomas will, uh, will uh, say more about that. And uh, pr probably Veronese is uh, less, uh, the less Venetian of the Venetians, I would say. Oh, yes, it is. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, and probably is the most uh, close to the, to the, um, to the, to the Raphael uh, maniers. So <clears throat> I don't want to say much about the, about uh, Raphael, and and since I'm not a specialist, and you will, I don't want to take time to to Thomas to talk about that. I just would like to to remind you that this event is organized in collaboration with the other institutes, and I would like to to name my all my uh, colleagues, uh, my dear colleagues that have helped to put together this series, and I invite you to check all the websites. Um, first of all, the website of the Instituto Italiano di Cultura in Toronto but also the website of the other institutes and check for the next uh, webinars. So <clears throat> it's a, it has been organized by the Instituto Italiano di Cultura in Chicago, director Luca Di Vito, in Los Angeles, director Valeria Rumori, in Montreal, Francesco Darelli, in New York, uh, by colleague Paolo Barlera, in San Francisco, by Anna Maria Di Giorgio, and last but not least, in Washington DC, by dear colleague Emanuele Amendola. So it has been a collect collective effort uh, to offer you the best we can, we can, we could find in terms of the scholars and specialists on Raffaello and all Italian art of the Renaissance. We will have more events uh, soon to come organized again by the Instituto in Toronto and the next will be in, on September 8th. We will have Giorgio Tagliafierro who is Associate Professor in History of Art at Warwick University. Uh, speaking about Raphael and Tiziano, and then we will have again Matthias Vivel, who is our <clears throat> absent curator of 16th century Italian paintings at the National Gallery in London, and he will be speaking about uh, the relation between uh, Raphael and Sebastiano del Piombo. So now I'll give you a little a brief introduction to Thomas de la Costa, despite the young age, is um, is already has already a long uh, CV. He's completed his PhD at the Verona University in June 2012 with a, dis with a dissertation on Paolo Veronese and the organization of his workshop. Then he has been fellow of the Dutch Institute of Art History in Florence 
and the Fondazione Hermitage Italia in Ferrara. 2015, Thomas was postdoctoral researcher at Verona University with a project on Tizian. The outcome of this research has been uh, published recently in Venere Adone di Tiziano, Arte, Cultura, Società tra Venezia e l'Europa. September 2016, he was appointed a research fellow for Save Venice, for which he edited a guide <coughs> book on Jacopo Tintoretto, published in 2018. In 2017, Thomas co-curated the exhibition Venezia Rinascimento Tiziano Tintoretto Veronese in, at the Pushkin Museum in Moscow an incredibly in, in relevant exhibition, I would say. For, and he has published a number of articles on Tizian, Tintoretto, and Veronese, and his workshop. He has a strong interest in the artist's creative process and the pivotal role of drawings to Venetian Renaissance workshops. By the way, if you love Venetian drawings, and drawings in general, I remind you that the AGO, the Art Gallery of Ontario, has an astonishing collection of drawings, including drawings from the Italian Renaissance. So thank you again for joining us and thank you, Thomas. Now the floor is yours. It is yours. I'm sure you will enjoy the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, thank you, everyone. Welcome. Good afternoon for you. It's good evening for me. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here today and it's an honor also to be part of this uh, very interesting series of events organized uh, to celebrate the 15th century, the fifth century of the day, of Raphael's day. Um, as I say, as Alessandro said in, in, in his, his introduction of me, I'm mostly a specialist, I'm a specialist in Venetian, in Italian Renaissance, but my main interest, my main focus is uh, Venetian Renaissance, my speciality in particular, and the 16th century. So this um, talk, in this talk, I will try to further understand the relationship between Raphael and uh, Paolo Veronese, who despite was born after Raphael's death, had looked very, very much into, into Raphael's production, as I will try to, uh, to show you, to demonstrate. So, um, Raphael is unquestionably one of the most influential artists of all times, we all know that. For centuries, he has been recognized as the supreme high Renaissance painter, more versatile than Michelangelo, and more prolific than this older contemporary Leonardo. Although he died when he was only 37, so very young, Raphael's example as a paragon of classicism dominated the academic tradition of European painting until the mid-19th century. Paolo Veronese, as we said already, we repeated several times, was born after Raphael's death in Verona. His early works are elaborately composed, they negotiate co-equally light and space. But later, Veronese's art has become emblematic of the splendor of Venetian Renaissance. Although one, of, one could argue his style is not quintessentially Venetian, that's something that actually we will see again. It's crowded yet ex expertly around the compositions, combining elegant posture, eloquent gesture, and classicism, uh, classicizing architectural backdrops, richness of detail, and painterly affluence, reminds those ones by Raphael, actually. A talented draftsman, Veronese was often, often employed as a fresco painter. He occasionally designed architectural compositions and lead a large and well-organized workshop. All these traits may suggest an even closer comparison between Veronese and the center Italian genius, Raphael. In this talk, I will highlight and discuss the number, a number of similarities between Veronese and Raphael, not only in terms of composition, but also in visual eloquence, graphic intelligence, and workshop practice. Although the main focus of the talk will be Veronese, and is either to underestimate interest for Raphael, in the first part of this uh, webinar, I will give you a brief overview on Raphael's work and life, uh, which will also um, help you and provide some essential historical and contextual code coordinates. Raffaello Santi, called Raphael, was born in 1483 in Urbino, in the Marche region, which is in the center of Italy, where his father, Giovanni, was the court painter. Very little is known about his early, li his early life, but he certainly began his training in his father's workshop and must have known works by Michelangelo, Paolo Uccello, and Piero della Francesca. So, 
this from an early age, and also thanks to the fact that his father worked within the Urbino court. His earlier works uh, were also greatly influenced by Pinturicchio, and especially Perugino, whose paintings and drawings he must have had the opportunity to study closely. From 1500, Raphael uh, became an independent master, and from 1500 to uh, 1508, he worked throughout Central Italy, particularly Florence, where he moved in 1504, and became a noted portraitist and painter of Madonnas. In this typology of paintings, Raphael shows his limitless creativity by inventing a countless number of variants where the painter displays all the tender emotions one may ex might expect between a young man and a grown child. In 1508, at the age of 25, he was called to the court of Pope Julius II to help with the redecoration of papal apartments. He frescoed uh, three rooms, which started to become known as Raphael Stanze, soon after the completion, their completion. He became acquainted also with Julius II's successor, Pope uh, Leo X, under whose patronage Raphael concluded the fresco and also provided cartoons for a set of 10 tapestries for the walls of the papal apartments. As we know, those 10 tapestries being um, displayed recently in, in Rome before actually uh, the lockdown started in late, uh, late February um, 2020. And this was a, an incredible event because the last time they were with, all shown together was in 1983 to celebrate the fourth, uh, the fifth century, the fourth century of the birth of, the, uh, of Raphael. So it's, um, it's quite um, a big year this year for Raphael. Um, in Rome, he further, he further evolved as a portraitist, a, gen, a genre that he contributed in transforming with his inventiveness and became one of the greatest of all history painters. He remained in Rome uh, for the rest of his life, and in 1514, on the death of Bramante, he was appointed architect in charge of St. Peter's. The next year, so in 1515, Raphael was made prefect of over all the antiquities in Rome, making the artist the first appointed caretaker of ancient art in history. And this is, again, quite an achievement. So basically his role was try to um, protect the, the Roman heritage and the, uh, and the ancient heritage of Rome. Um, <clears throat> in this capacity, he proposed to create a map to list and document what remained of the ancient city. And this, of course, the test would have helped him in protect the, uh, the, Roman, uh, the Roman heritage. When he died on Good Friday, 1520, he was at the top of his fame, loved and, and admired by everyone. And in fact, the entire city of Rome is thought to have been in mourning. Raphael Art was vastly acclaimed by his contemporaries for the clarity of his forms, his delicate handling, its rich and brilliant palette, and its skill in representing an ideal world of, gra of grace and perfection. However, one of Raphael's most appreciated characteristics is certainly the ease of composition of his works. His attention to composition has few rivals in the history of art, uh, and for me, his pursuit to beauty never stops to reward no matter how many times I go and look at his paintings. In fact, I never take a walk in the National Gallery without paying a, a visit to our outstanding collection of Raphael works. This is just a private detail of my, of my life, actually, of my life at the gallery. So, Raphael was aged 21 when he traveled to Florence, Tuscany, in the year 1504. Florence was one of the greatest artistic center of Italy at the time and had a fiercely and competitive artistic scene. In the city, known for disegno, which stays for drawing or design, and, and more broadly, broadly for draftsmanship, he sets about bringing his techniques to the new level of expression. Composition, as I say, played a vital role. The precise arrangement of elements in a painted space gave his works an inner unity and structural balance. Perhaps more than any other artists of his generation, such as Piero della Francesca and Paolo Uccello, among the others, 
Um, Raphael made use of composition to elevate his art towards the Renaissance ideal of mathematical harmony and perfection. One of Raphael's earliest work from his Florentine period is the altarpiece of the, with the uh, Madonna and Child with the St. John and Baptist, Saint Nicholas in Bari, also known as the Anse Dei Madonna, which is uh, at the London National Gallery. This is the main panel of the altarpiece Raphael painted for the Anse Dei Family Chapel in the uh, Servite Church of San Fiorenzo in Perugia in 1505. The Virgin sits in majesty on a wooden throne with a child, uh, with a Christ child on her lap. She draws his attention to a passage in the book on her knee. A string of coral be beads is suspended from the throne, and it, this is a reminder of the blood Christ will spill at the, at the moment of the crucifixion. John the Baptist points to the infant Christ with his right hand, with his right uh, hand, and gazes at his own cross in premonition of Christ's future death. Saint Nicholas, to the right, um, apparently the less engaged protagonist of the painting, is concentra uh, concentrates on his book. What we immediately understand is that in this image, everything is interwoven from gesture to attitude, position, and gazes direction of the characters. Analysis carried out at the National Gallery uh, in London have revealed that Raphael carefully calculated the geometry of the composition using an, inc an incised grid to divide it horizontally and vertically into harmonious thirds before he began painting. In fact, the space of the painting is divided into three equal bands, running both vertically and horizontally, providing an underlying grid structure. As you can see, the, the dividing basically the picture into nine parts. There is, a clearly, there is clearly a circular core to the work too, made by the monumental arch at the top that opens out to a landscape. Lines of perspective draw the eye towards the heart of the, uh, the, the, art of the work, which is the virgin and child. The achievement of the artist is to make none of these very elaborated geometrical elements look forced, but are actually conversely harmonious and balanced. A year after this altar piece, Raphael, so in 1506, Raphael painted the Madonna of the Meadows, also known as the Madonna del Belvedere, after the Viennese castle, where it hung for many, many years. In this work, the influence of Leonardo da Vinci is evident in the apparent pyramidal composition. Raphael has moved away from the strict grid structure that we have seen just a few months before in the Anse de Madonna, and, we, um, and making a work that is more personal and in the end simplified, but not, uh, not basic. Mary's head creates the top of triangle shape. The points of the base uh, are made by her extended right foot and the toes of the John the Baptist. There is an inner triangle too, formed between the two children and the shapes of, Mary, of Mary's reaching arm. The unified format gives the work an, an architectural structure. Again, the naturalism of the figure blended with this highly formal structure is a wonderful achievement and everything flows naturally in the painting. Nothing seems forced, seems to be forced here. In 1508, as we have seen, Raphael moved to Rome he was conveyed there by Pope Julius II to decorate his personal apartments in the Vatican. The new commission meant uh, a fresh set of artistic challenges to the artists, who now began working on larger projects. As Raphael worked, uh, uh, Raphael's work grew in maturity, his reliance on the pyramid, on the pyramid structure uh, evolved into a softer blend of structural elements. Look, for instance, to the so-called Garba Madonna, painted in about 1508 and 1509, and now in the National Gallery in London. This little picture, I can tell you it's actually little, very little, it's about 50 centimeters uh, high and 38, 40 less. Uh, wide. So it's a, it's a tiny little picture, it's very, very precious, a kind of little gem, a jewel made for a private devotion, probably for a private patron. This little picture depicts the moment 
when Christ receives a carnation or a thing, which is a symbol of divine love and also a symbol of the passion, from the hands of his cousin, St. John the Baptist. The space between the children's hands is the geometrical center of the composition, while the perfect oval of the virgin head set between the vertical elements of the architecture reveals again Raphael's interest in a pure geometrical order, reflecting the grace of interaction between the figures. And once again, here you can see that there is a triangular shape. Other interesting works are the Esterhazy Madonna, which is in Budapest, a painting, uh, 1508 painting, and the Alba Madonna, a painting Raphael made in 1510, depicting Mary, Jesus, and John the Baptist in a typical Italian countryside. In both the paintings, the triangular composition is still present, but it is allowed to flex with a degree of tonefulness uh, that is completely new to Raphael's work. Analytical movement here, and there's more dynamic, more dynamic, dynamicity. Analytical movement creates a beautiful and harmonic rhythm across the room. These are the kind of images that Veronese may have studied and admired so, profound, so profoundly, as we shall see, since the beginning of his career. Raphael, growing interest in a pure geometrical and therefore harmonious order, is clearly visible also in his frescoes for the so called stanze. The first and most famous room painted by Raffaed is the so-called so Stanza della Signatura that you can see here in this slide. It's just uh, up one of the corners, it's actually like four um, walls, uh, all presented by Raffaed in his workshop. The room originally housed the library of the Pope and the fresco decoration on the walls may have reflected the different sections the books were divided in. The most famous fresco of the Signatura is the so-called School of Athens, is actually this school of Athens. And it may even be considered one of the most influential paintings of Raphael's lifetime. And probably one of, very likely, one of the most influential paintings uh, in the history of, of humanity. The scene frescoed by the artist take place in the city of Lyceum and depicts the most accomplished and illustrious philosophers and scientists Throughout the entire painting, Raphael focuses the viewer's attention to his perspective point through the use um, of the movement down by following the arches as well as balancing effects on the protagonist on the opposite sides of the center that I can, I can show you here with the red dot where the center is. The central figures which lie on the either side of the point of perspective depict the two most famous philosophers of Plato on the, to the left and Aristotle to the right. Every element is precisely arranged in order to give the composition a inner unity and structural balance. Nothing seems to be out of place and every detail plays a decisive role in the final image. A shared element in all the rooms the four rooms that Raphael painted here in the Santa Signatura and um, in, the, in, in all the four rooms that he painted in the Vatican is the calculated and illusionistic background and, and, and architectural setting, which is a peculiarity that we will find also in Veronese's work, as well as careful attention uh, for the harmonious order and the composition and the key role played by each figure. All these elements are, will, will be like shared elements with, uh, with Veronese as well. Raphael was not only a great painter, but he was also one of the most fascinating and exceptional draftsmen of all time. With supreme mastery, he used the techniques available to in his days, pen and ink, red and black chalk, charcoal, silver point, preliminary drawings with a stylus, washes applied with a brush and white eye. As his painting, as in paintings, even in drawing, he was open to suggestions and influence taken from other masters. Initially from his teacher Pietro, uh, Pietro Perugino, Pinturicchio and Luca Signorelli, and then when he moved to Florence from Leonardo, Michelangelo and Fra Bartolomeo, eventually when in Rome after 1508, he looked at Michelangelo again. Nevertheless, Raphael did not schematically adopt the drawing style of these artists. Conversely, 
assimilated, he assimilated their ideas and adapted them on his own purposes in order to create his own style. Despite the influence of other artists, Raphael's style of drawing is unique and nearly distinctive. Indeed, it is clearly different from that of his other contemporaries. Also, his pupils and successors were unable to grasp his work in its totality and only adopted part of his ideas. Observing Raphael's pen and ink drawings, one immediately realized that in his sheet, the forms are indicated with loose pen lines that generally have a rounding effect. Exact positions of the figures, their arms and legs, gestures, and even the foreshortening of his drawing rarely differs from the final painted version, as we can appreciate here in this drawing that actually is preparatory for the Esther Alte Madonna, and is a beautiful um, sheet, which is in the uh, Florence, Florence uh, Gabinetto degli Uffizi di Disegni delle Stampe in the Office. In this drawing, we appreciate Raphael's extraordinary ability in providing with only a few loose pen lines, a sense of plasticity and three-dimensionality. With remarkable confidence and nonchalance, the artist captures the essence of the movement using only a few lines set down on the sheet with a curving gesture. Generations of scholars have pointed out how Raphael always insists that his figures act in individually. In his drawings, such as in, in, in his paintings, every action is alive and imbued with a sense of both naturality and absolute necessity. In fact, if you look at his very more complicated compositions, uh, every single figure plays a, a, a very fundamental role in the composition. What is particularly interesting to me, though, is the definition that Lisa Pond, an American scholar, adopted a few years ago to explain Raphael's ease of invention. Discussing his draftsman skills, indeed, she used the term graphic intelligence to mean Raphael's way to solve habitual pro uh, pictorial problems. According to Lisa Pond, Raphael used this type of intelligence to shape the decisions he was making in producing a picture and I quote, even frames the alternatives from which the choices can be made, end of quotation. To make it short and simple, Raphael used drawings as one tool into the problem solving of picture making. Um, this represents to me not only the most unique quality of Raphael's work in terms of drawings, but it is also an incredible parallel uh, to, with the working method that Paolo Veronese would have later adopted. This prestige on Raphael, in Raphael's art, was essential to make my point in comparison with Veronese's. In the second part of this talk, I will therefore try to offer an overview of the several points of contact we can find between the two artists, art and practice. As I did in the first part of my paper, uh, to start, I will provide some biogra biographical information on Paolo Veronese, for then presenting analysis of his, an analysis of his works and the way through which this could be somehow compared to Raphael. So, compared with the more adventurous uh, life of Raphael, Paolo Veronese had a less dynamic and almost boring life. So he did not travel as much as Raphael. Uh, he mostly spent his life in the Veneto region. He wasn't like traveling around Rome, Florence, and so on. Um, he was not a womanizer. We know that there are some rumors that probably uh, Raphael uh, died for uh, a sexual disease he contracted. And, and actually, conversely, he had a family. Veronese had a family, was married, had some kids, and he was uh, a conscientious Christian. Nonetheless, Veronese is one of the giants of Venetian and Re Italian Renaissance, and his ability in combining great compositions and a masterful use of color make him a sublime artist. He was born in Verona, in the Veneto region, in 1528, therefore eight years after Raphael's death. A city of Roman foundation, Verona still bears traces of this important heritage, as Roman ruins are incorporated with nonchalance into the everyday fabric of the infrastructure. This is a slide with the uh, Arena di Verona, which is um, an, a Roman theater. It's probably the most well-preserved um, Roman uh, amphitheater in the world and is still in use. It's in concerts every year. 
and other, kind of, and other kind of events. Verona was also at the crossroad of an important commercial route, which connected the Veneto not only with Lombard cities and states nearby, such as Brescia and Mantua, for example, but also with the north of Europe, in particular with the low part of Germany, through the River Adige. The son of a stone cutter, so it was like a very dynamic place where there were like several, um, it could have encountered several uh, influences and several other like several like, ideas and several visual sources. The son of, stone, of a stone cutter or a scalpellino, Veronese was initially trained in his father's workshop where according to his first biographer, Carlo Ridolfi, he learned how to make clay models. This peculiar situation provided Veronese with a variety of sources he could meditate on. Indeed, his father and grandfather activities as stone cutters, together with the experience he made in a city of uh, Roman heritage, may have influenced Paolo. In fact, it can be argued that he never lost his, death, his deep interest in the sculptural medium, and both his paintings and drawings, as we shall see, witness a concert with the three-dimensional forms in space. Little is known about Paolo's earliest years and apprenticeship, but in his late teens as Raphael, he must have already been an accomplished artist. If in 1548, and it was like when he was like only 20, he painted this altarpiece, which is quite big, over three meters tall, for the Bevilacqua Thesis private chapel in the Church of San Fermo. In 1551, he was in charge, in full charge, so he was only 21. Uh, of his third large-scale commission for the fresco uh, at the Villa Soranza in Treville, near Treviso. Fresco decoration was one of Veronese's preferred media, and he would have been busy with similar commissions many other, in many other circumstances uh, in, later in his, in his career. Around 1550, 1552, he's also painted The Temptation of St. Anthony for one of the altars of the Mantua Cathedral. This picture well reflects Veronese's interests for central Italian and more in general for sculptural, three-dimensional forms and composition. The last time Veronese is recorded as living in Verona is in 1553, while by 1555 he moved to Venice where he rented a house and workshop. From now onwards, his fame was, the, uh, was to be linked to the capital of the Serenissima, where, the painter, the, uh, where he painted the majority of his works. His first Venetian commission involved in particular two buildings where he would have worked for the most of his career. The Ducal Palace on one hand, with the first commission in 1555, and the Church of San Sebastiano uh, with the first commission in 1555, which one could say it's somehow Veronese's Sistine Chapel, because uh, basically he painted every, almost everything here. Every single uh, part of the church is decorated by him. So he paints like frescoes, the ceilings, the presbytery, the sacristy, even the, um, the shutters of the organ, uh, and some paintings in, in, chap in, in lateral chapels. Moreover, also, when he died, he was also buried in this, uh, in this church. Uh, you can see it's to the left under the organ. So it's somehow, yeah, you, one could say it's like the uh, Veronese Sistine Chapel. So his greatest achievement. Commissions for official spaces, private houses, churches, requests for portraits and fresco decorations, but mostly mythological and religious paintings started flowing. And suddenly it was extremely busy. As like as Raphael, Veronese was enormously productive, running a large and well-organized workshop. And he, and he explored several media of this. The 1560s represents the high of Veronese's career, and works from this decade share similar themes in their conception. His compositions are balanced and clear, and even in crowded scenes, such as in his Elegant's Last Supper, the artist creates a group of figures effectively set against an architectural backdrop, general reminiscent of the design. Uh, of architects such as Michele San Michele and Andrea Palladio. In this image, I'm showing you the uh, wedding, at, when the wedding at Cana, painted in, in the space of only three months. It's incredible, it's a great achievement because it's 
quite a big painting. It's like over six meters per, per, per five meters tall, and uh, which is in the Louvre and was painted uh, in 1562 for the uh, presbytery, uh, for the uh, refectory of the Church of San Giorgio Maggiore in, uh, in Venice. Veronese figures were rich draperies in light colors, such as brilliant green and light blue, rich orange and brilliant yellow, white and pink. The most impressive characteristic of this work of this decade, though, is the surprisingly high level of consistency in terms of style. In the 1570s, Veronese's style changes, and his works are compositionally more complicate, complicated and crowded. The color tones more vigorous and less bright, and the shadows deeper than before. One more time, though, the gesture of the figures is theatrical, and every single element of the composition is synchronized. In this decade, he received several large-scale commissions, from altarpieces to paintings for refectories, and such as this one is the famous um, ha um, Feast in the House of Levy, in the de l'Accademia Venice, uh, and also important frescoes decorations in villas uh, for the, uh, of the Venetian mainland, which were mostly delegated to these assistants. With large commissions, indeed, the role of his workshop shifted, becoming a family business, which involved, on one hand, his brother uh, Benedetto, who was 10 years younger than Paolo, and he, he has always been his main, import, main assistant, and his sons, Gabriele and Carletto, uh, along with many other artists whose hands become easier to detect. By the end of his career, in the early 1580s, Veronese reached an elevated social status that allowed him to invest some money in the acquisition of some land and a house in the area of Treviso. Other public commissions in the Ducal Palace, in particular the large uh, canvas with the Triumph of Venice decorating the ceiling of the Sala del Maggior Consiglio, kept Paolo particularly busy in this decade. Veronese died quite unexpectedly on 19th April 1588, when he was only 60, after the deterioration of a pulmonary infection he caught in Treviso, while assisting a religious procession during the local Easter celebrations. The effortless elegance embodied by his works and the artist's virtuoso technique made Veronese one of the most celebrated artists in 16th century Venice. But it's one question that I, I now want to, 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 to try to investigate here, try to reply to, it's how could a Veronese meet, met Raphael? So according to Carlo Ridolfi, the first biographer of Paolo Veronese, who in, 15, in 1648 wrote the Maraviglie dell'Arte, a book of leaves of the Venetian painters, the decade of the 1560s for Veronese opened with a trip to Rome, during which the painter saw, and I quote, the magnificence of the buildings, the paintings by Raphael, the sculptures of Michelangelo, and in particular the celebrated sculptures, precious relics of Roman grandeur, end of quotation. Despite this hypothesis, it's fascinating, and some scholars still believe in this, um, there is no evidence that Veronese traveled to Rome. Moreover, his interest for Raphael, Michelangelo, and in classical antiquity was lo uh, long-standing, and it can be traced back to his youth in Verona. There are indeed other ways Veronese may have been aware of Raphael and his style in paintings, drawings, and architecture, as well as classical antiquities, even without traveling to Rome. In fact, Veronese must have been in contact with Raphael at the very early stage of his career. Around 1545, he must have like, entered in contact with him somehow. When, in 1545, he was like a young artist and he was working in the fresco decoration of the bar, of the vaults of two small rooms on the main floor of the partly completed palace. The building, which sits nearby the Museo di Castelvecchio in Verona, was designed by Michele San Michele, an architect who worked in Rome and acted as a kind of mentor for, young, for the young Veronese, suggesting he be engaged in many frescoes decorations. He was the one who provided his first important commission when he was like in charge 
of the uh, 1551 decoration of the uh, that I previously mentioned. So has always been a, a very important, a crucial, uh, a mentor for me. As Giorgio Vasari reported in his Life of the Most Eminent Sculptures, Painters and Architects, when speaking of San Michele, when telling us the, the San Michele's life, indeed, the, um, Vasari tells us that the architect, the architect was very, very close with the talented artist. And he loved him as a son, I quote. So, lo amava come un figliolo, he said. So, it must, must be something. San Michele may have recommended the young Veronese to the Canossa family, who were not only important patrons, patrons but also refined art collectors. Indeed, they owned the so-called Pier Madonna. The name of the, uh, of the picture is actually, well, it's technically a uh, holy family with Saint Anne. But Philip IV, who was like the king of Spain, called this painting the Pier uh, because he thought that it was his favorite among all the pieces in his collection. The composition was designed by Raphael, but part of the execution was delegated to his pupil, Giulio Romano. As in, order, as in other late works by Raphael, we find considerable emphasis on the landscape and contrast of light and on the pyramidal arrangement of the figures, which is the result of the artist's re-encounter with the work of Leonardo in Rome, as we, previously, as we have previously seen. It was originally painted for Ludovico Canossa, a member of the Canossa family, and it was only, and it was on display in the familiar palazzo when Veronese was at work there in 1545. We know that. Veronese must have studied closely the picture between, 15, between around 1545 and 1547, from which he grasped all the secrets of Raphael's sensitivity for the composition, as clearly demonstrated by some early works of the young Paolo. Look, for instance, at this painting. One of the earliest independent work by, works by Veronese, who painted it in an in occasion of the wedding between Anna della Torre and Gian Battista Pindemonte, celebrated in Verona in, 15, in 1547, as confirmed by the coat of arms of the two families that we can see at the top left corner of the picture, that is here highlighted. The cool colors, the composition which insists even here on a pyramid, pyramid the landscape opening on, only on one side of the picture and eventually the attention for the intimate relationship between the figures and their gesture would have been unconceivable for the young Veronese without a meditation on Raphael's masterful composition. And here is, is a comparison for you to, to help you to uh, visualize what I'm saying. This become even clearer in the next image, if you want, where I, I've also highlighted something. Uh, which is the mystic marriage uh, of St. Catherine, dated about 1548, currently at the Yale University Art Gallery in the, in the United States, in which I have also highlighted the structure of the composition as it was conceived by Veronese. As you can see here, again, there, are, there is this kind of double inner uh, triangle, as we have seen in, in many of uh, Raphael's works. Eventually, I would also like to show you another version of the same subject, uh, which was clearly a successful and traditional wedding uh, gift during the Renaissance. In fact, the, the idea of the, um, the, the mystic marriage of St. Catherine uh, was a typical uh, painting that you, you could have find as a get presented with when you get, when you get married in the, in the Renaissance. So, and you can see here in, clearly in this painting how this picture also with the gesture of Saint Anne here, the presence of Saint Anne like embracing the Virgin, as we have seen, for example, typically in the Perla Madonna, where, uh, where, where is Mary uh, embracing her mom, embracing um, husband. In Veronese's early works, colors are luminous and cool, rich and differentiated. Like those ones, Raphael used in particular in his Florentine period. His work, this work depicts the conversion of the Jewish woman Mary Magdalene, a story which is absent from the, uh, from the Bible, but it is, it is told in other sources, including the humanity of Christ, 
a book written in 1535 by Pietro Aretino. An Italian playwright, poet, satirist, Black, black Mailer, Aretino was a controversial character who had to flee Rome after having published some pornographic novels and moved to the more open-minded and welcoming Venice. However, this religious book was printed in Venice and was a kind of moder uh, modernized version of the gospel and it became suddenly a, a kind of bestseller. Veronese shows the moment when Martha takes her sister Mary Magdalene, who is in Western Christianity was considered to be a promiscuous woman, if not even a prostitute, to the temple to hear Christ preach, as she is worried about her spiritual health. Stunned, stunned and overcome by Christ's words, Mary blushes with shame and sinks to her knees, and is here represented the center of the composition, like actually literally. Uh, on her knees. Mary's fashionably uh, low-cut 16th century dress, which is completely inappropriate to, for a visit to a, uh, to a temple, as we can see, is a sign of her formerly sinful life of vanity and pleasure. Mary is immediately converted by her encounter with Christ and turns to a life of piety. The jewelry slipping from her neck suggests her decision to reject worldly vanities and become a follower of Christ. This picture demonstrates Veronese's sophisticated and witty approach to narrative and composition, which is again something that I can, be, I can stress, can, I can keep stressing, is very, very close to Raphael. He was a very theatrical painter, and in the best sense, using broad and subtle gestures, such as the expressive and rhythmic play of hands here in the center of the composition to transmit the, thought, uh, the thoughts and emotion of his characters, a quality which remind me again so much of her. The inward turning cure of the figures on the right of the, of the painting is matched by the outward turning one of the architecture seen through the door in the wall, in the wall on the left. The architecture of the courtyard is based on Michele San Michele's great curving toy screen for the Verona, uh, for the Verona Cathedral, uh, designed and built in 1534. We can find a similar interest um, in, for, a cur for a curving classical uh, architecture, even in this splendid picture, which is the Christ uh, among the doctors uh, in the temple, in the Prado Museum, painted in about 1555. It tells us the story of Christ is the last story of uh, Christ's childhood, basically, uh, when as a teenager, he goes to uh, Jerusalem with his mom and dad, and for some point, because they are going there for uh, um, a religious event, um, and at some point, basically, they, 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 lost him. they lose him. Uh, they cannot find him anymore. And uh, the reason is why, uh, because he's like in the, in the temple, debating and arguing, literally arguing with the, uh, uh, with the doctors of the of the law, so the, the, the rabbi and the other priests. And here is represented in a very elevated position, as you can see, and with a very theatrical ge and gesture and like um, elo eloquent po uh, posture is pre is pre presented by the painter at the top because it is in a, he wants to stress the fact that he's superior, he's superior in this in this moment. And he, he is like counting on one hand. And with the other hand, again with this very uh, eloquent gesture, is pointing towards a fee, uh, the, the chair here that we can see, the, the architecture, like circle, circular architecture we can see uh, on the right, and also toward the figure that actually standing, um, dressing as a pilgrim, with wearing a, a coat, a mantle, with uh, a cross of the pilgrim, who is uh, clearly the, um, the patron, the, the person who is actually uh, paid for the painting. So this is a, is a very co uh, complicated picture. It's quite big. It's over four meters long. So uh, it's, it's a very uh, well organized and well structured painting. In his uh, architectural language, San Michele, the architect we were talking about before, was clearly interest, interested in what Giulio Romano one of Raphael's most successful, successful pupils, as we say, and as Raphael, he was like not only a painter, but also an architect. So 
he was interested in what Giulio Romano was um, introducing in the near city of uh, Mantua, where he worked, he, tra he moved in uh, 1524. Together with Giulio Romano in Mantua and Jacopo Sansovino in Venice, in fact, Michele San Michele wanted to revamp Raphael's late architectural style, and they wanted to do it in the Veneto. So Veronese must have been well aware of this if he was so acquainted uh, to, to San Michele since uh, a very early stage of his career. In Veronese's paintings, such as in Raphael's, the action flows naturally and every figure is interwoven one to another. They act individually, but they are an absolute necessity in order to balance out the final composition. We could not work if deprived of one of its figures. This becomes particularly evident for Veronese in paintings such as the, uh, the Feminist Darius, again here at the National Gallery in London, after defeating uh, King Darius III of, per of Persia, who fled after the Battle of Issus in 1330 before Christ, Alexander the Great, who was like the 20 years old Macedonian emperor, visited Darius's worried family. Dressed in a blue ermine lined cloak, Darius's mother, Sisis Gambis, kneels before Alexander, Alexander's friend, Ephaestin, mistaking him from, uh, for the victor. Ephaestion, which is here in this in Bernese's painting, uh, wearing an armor and an orange cloak to the right, li uh, seems literally taken back and points to himself in surprise and say, wow, no, no, it's not me. I'm sorry, you, you're wrong, basically, he seems to say. Alexander, uh, so at that point, Sisis Gambi is completely dis uh, is, is disparated, and she said, oh, well, I made such a big mistake. I mistaken uh, up a, a servant or a, a general, a simple man of the army for the emperor, now the emperor will never have any, uh, any, any piety for me and for my family and for my son. But Alexander comforts this is Gambis by gratuitously observing that Ephesians is another Alexander, so he's an example of virtue and of humility. So close a friend that they were as one. That's what he said, actually. So in this amazing uh, picture, Veronese has used the, the hand gesture to indicate the di this dialogue between Alexander and Sissis Gambis. Moreover, the effortlessness with which the gazes are synchronized is that um, in this, as in other Veronese's works, is one of the most, uh, is once again, one of the most, very, is very, very Raphaelesque to me. An interesting, as well as obvious case demonstrating Veronese's full awareness of Rafa's achievement and inventiveness and his acknowledgement of the status and importance of the central Italian genius is provided by the following example, which involves a drawing by Rafa, a print by Marcantonio Raimondi, who worked extensively with Rafa when in Rome, and a painting by Veronese. The painting is this one, is the Dream of St. Helena, painted about 1570, now at the National Gallery, uh, where Helena, uh, it's painted here, like sitting uh, by a window. Helena was the, uh, the mother of the first uh, Christian emperor, Constantine. She dreamed that an angel revealed to her the location where, uh, of the cross on which Christ was crucified. And urged her to travel to the Holy Land to find it. She was an example, an example of pilgrimage somehow. She traveled, she goes there, she started excavating, and she finally found three, um, three different crosses. And by testing their uh, healing power, it was, she was able to identify which was, uh, which was uh, Christ's cross, and known now from, from that moment onwards as the true cross. In Veronese's painting, St. Helena sits with one foot on, uh, up on a stone bench in a window alcove, her head resting in her hand, her elbow on the window's ledge. As she sleeps, two winged carrots appear as a vision in the sky, carrying the true cross. The composition is highly unusual in Veronese's work, and the economical way in which it's painted, it's, it's masterly. 
Most important to me, though, is the fact that this picture composition was derived from a print uh, of Saint Helena by Marco Antonio Raimondi, probably of Antonio Raimondi, uh, which itself based it on a drawing by Raphael. You can see here a version of the print to the left, which is at the British Museum in London, and uh, the drawing, which is at the Uffizi. The, the print probably represents Saint Helena, although Raphael's drawing may have been intended as someone else. An early inscription, in fact, identifies it as Sanai. Indeed, the drawing is a series of forms uh, and studies which focuses above all on charming female figure, seated uh, on the charming female figure, seated and leaning on a kind of parapet, very, very similar to the one that we've seen in, in Veronese's painting. The figure of the young woman is mainly inspired by the relief of an ancient sarcophagus, once in the Albani del Drago collection in Rome, so Raphael must have seen it there. The indication proposed by the writing Danid added on in ink. Uh, on the front margin of the sheet, and you can see here, I highlighted it for you where, where the inscription is, suggests that for Raphael, the relief might have been interpreted as the myth of Danae. The heroine would therefore be resting on the parapet on the window inside the tower where she had been shot with by her father, Acrisius, to avoid the peril of being killed by Danae's future son, Perseus. It is an original interpretation, and, in line, and it is in line, actually, with medi medieval iconography. In Middle Ages, Danae as a figure of it was a figure of, of digital conception, and it was linked, uh, linked to the Virgin Mary and the incarnation of the world. Raphael wanted to emphasize uh, Danae's innocence in the conception of Perseus, showing her as a completely dressed and totally free of the erotic connotations of the figures, later portrayed by Correggio or Titian, for example, as you can see here to the left, and the painting by Titian is way more um, seductive and sensual, whereas, uh, conversely, Raphael's solution is way more uh, virtuous. It is highly unlikely that Veronese knew Raphael's drawing. However, he must have looked at the print taken by the drawing of the of the center, uh, center Italian master when in the process of conceiving his paintings. And he must have known that that, pin, uh, that uh, print was actually coming from uh, drawings by Raphael. Although Paolo uh, Veronese lived and worked in Venice, in Venice, the city known for colore, which stands for color, where according to a renowned 16th century uh, debate, artists were scarcely interested in disegno, the alma of the Florentine art, as we have seen before, Paolo was actually a gifted draftsman who used drawing and design in an intellectual sense, as much as Raphael, as Michelangelo did. Veronese's gra graphic art is not even comparable in terms of numbers and so of surviving drawings with, other, uh, with the ones by Raphael, which is more substantial. Nonetheless, its catalog includes over 150 autograph drawings, which is quite a lot for, for, for a Venetian artist. If you think that Titian, who lived like many years, almost 30 years more than Paolo Veronese, uh, has a catalog of pretty much 36, 37 drawings, Paolo Veronese has like 150, uh, it's quite a substantial difference. And these 150 uh, drawings makes uh, him one of the most prolific Venetian draftsmen of all times. This remarkable wealth of drawing by Veronese indicates not only that his drawings were highly regarded amongst collectors and, 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 and had an immediate success, but he, that he also used to draw more and way more than his contemporaries. This is exactly what happened with Raphael, whose uh, corpus of autographs surrounding drawings counts some 400 sheets in only 20 years of activity. This is quite, again, very, very much, very something. This high number of drawings tell us a, a lot about the way Raphael, but also Veronese, were able to expand the inventive phase of work 
making drawing as a strictly necessary step toward the final product of their effort, which is the painting. According again to Carlo Ridolfi, Paolo had studied Dürer's woodcut at the beginning of his training and, and, and then later Parmigianino's drawings. The bold etching in the pen and ink studies for fame, peace, and a cartouche that we can see here, or studies for Gregory, which is in Hamburg, Kunsthalle, in German, um, reveals clearly his depth to Albrecht Dürer, while the tendency to fill the sheet with figures repeated several times in a slightly different position or attitude is a characteristic that we, we, we find not only in Parmigianino, to be honest, but also in drawings by Perino del Vaga, Federico Zuccari, Lelio Orsi, and, uh, and many others. Ultimately, all these artists have looked closely at Rafa. In his early career, Bernese came into contact not only with the Venetian tradition, Venetian tradition, but also with the style of drawing of other artists, of other areas such as Lombardy, Emilia, and above all, Central Italy. He certainly came into contact with drawings by Raphael and mostly by Giulio Romano, who was, as we have seen, uh, Raphael's um, pupil. And this apprenticeship, which is very, very uncommon for a Venetian artist, is reflected on Veronese's use on pen and ink, and the medium that he also preferred in his vivid brainstorming drawings. More generally, though, uh, he used many graphic techniques. In fact, his corpus is also composed of studies of uh, figures in black chalk, presentation drawings, and renewal chiaroscuro drawings, which probably convey the success of the chiaroscuro paints realized by artists like Antonio da Trento, Antonio Campi, and Ugo da Carpi. Every technique corresponds to a specific function, function because in Veronese's mind, every step of a painting passes through the drawing. In terms of use of drawing and creative process, this is one of them, uh, of one more time, a shared element with Raphael, who used to rely on drawing and is graphic intelligence, as we have seen before, to solve habitual pictorial, pictorial problems. As Raphael did, even Veronese started sketching his first idea with pen and ink, often changing rap in mind rapidly and drawing different variations of the pose of the same figures on the same sheet with a quick, confident, and free stroke. I brought you to the left, you have like um, a sheet of studies, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, uh, by Paolo Bernese, it realized probably around 1570, uh, the 15, um, around 1570, for the allegories of love. As we can see in, in, the, in, in Raphael's drawings, which is to the right in the Albertina, he keep repeating, keeps repeating with just a few strokes, uh, the same figure, and he studies in like multiple times, like one, two, three, four, five, six times, in order to find the right balance, the, uh, the, the, the right composition, the right figure that he actually then wants to develop, to further develop and uh, transform into painting, transport into painting. These kind of drawings were called primi pensieri, or uh, first thoughts, like very, very uh, sketchy thoughts. The primo pensiero was normally followed in Veronese by a deeper study of some of the most important figures made in black chalk, alternate with white on blue paper. This is a beautiful drawing which is uh, in the British Museum in London and um, it was made in the, in, at the end of the in 70s uh, in, in order to prepare a decoration of one of the figures in the ceiling of the Palazzo di Carre. Um, and it's made, again, as I said, in, on, in this kind of like three very quick strokes uh, in black and with white, highlighted with white, and using a blue paper uh, as, a, as a base. This helped basically uh, give, gave the opportunity to the artist to have an extra tone to work on and to study more the three-dimensionality and the, the sculpture form of the figures. So this is, again, something that returns uh, and constantly in Bernice's career, it, it didn't not just start as a, a like probably 
modeling some clay sculptures and studying sculptures in, Ro in Verona and, and near, in nearby cities. But mostly, uh, it keeps like developing this idea of three dimensional sp um, sp of space and three dimensionality in sculptural figures. Eventually, all these studies were collected together in a detailed model, normally very close to the final result. For these reasons, one could argue, argue that Veronese used drawing as an intellectual tool. Such a variegated approach to drawing makes Veronese the, less, the least Venetian draftsman of the 16th century in the Veneto, and rather close to the Florentine approach in terms of disegno or drawing. So everything was like actually delegated to the phase of the design of drawing. It is therefore particularly interesting to notice how Raphael's peculiar creative process is described by Ludovico Dolce, a Venetian man of letters and theorist of painting in his Dialogue of Painting, published in 1557. When in his first sketches, the painter tries out the imaginings that the narrative called to his mind, he should not be content with a single one, but should seek more invention and then choose that one which succeeds the best, considering all the elements together as well as each one separately. This is how Raphael himself, who was so rich in inventiveness, used to work, always coming up with four or six different ways to show a narrative, each one different from the rest, and all of them full of grace and well done." End of quotation. It is eventually even more surprising to notice how this description, which Dolce wrote, writes for in describing Raphael's method, fit, fits with Veronese's working method and, create, and his creative process. It was through the strict application of these methods that both Raphael and Veronese managed to run their large, busy, and successful workshops. Although born in a, uh, a few years after Raphael's death, Veronese must have known the works of the former very well and have studied his drawings and his paintings closely, as I tried to show you today. He understood Raphael pictorial and graphical intelligence so well and so in depth that he was able to adapt, to adapt it to its own working methods. This secret, this Raphael, is perhaps what consigned also Veronese to the eternity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you. For this really eloquent um, presentation and extremely enjoyable, despite the fact that it was still very scholarly, really re relevant. I really liked it. We, I'm, I'm happy we have a number of questions here on the Q&A, so I will present them to you uh, right away, without so further ado. So the first is from Rachel Friedman, and um, uh, Rachel is asking, Raphael's style was his own, to be sure, but his pen and ink drawings seem to emulate Leonardo's style, especially the movement and dynamism. Can we say that? Oh yes, it can absolutely be said that, um, and there are some drawings where actually, especially when it's like drawing Madonnas, that they are very, very close, and he must have seen them, but as I said, Rafa, and he's also somehow accused also by Vasari in his life, to be a kind of uh, a thief, because it was like uh, taking like bits and bytes from here and there, Actually, it was like copying, uh, according to, to Vasari, from other artists, including, of course, Leonardo and Michelangelo. But uh, mostly, Raphael was able to uh, process all these, uh, these drawings and all these styles and condense them in a new, different style, and actually evolve, evolving them. But yes, it can definitely be said that it, it's somehow close to, to, to Leonardo. Yeah, we all have in mind all the Sanguigna paintings by Leonardo, so, yeah. so famous. So yeah, famous. absolutely. Lars asking, hi, can you give me the tombstone of Raphael's drawing of the hands? I believe it's a detail in charcoal of yeah. a larger study. It, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, hi, Lara. Um, it's a charcoal, 
Yeah, if, um, I can remember where, where, which one is. It's the study with the two apostles, uh, which is in the Oxford Ashmolean Museum. It should be in the Oxford Ashmolean Museum, and it's the, it's the studies with the apostles. So on one hand, uh, on one side of the sheet, uh, it's, it's quite one of his most, most famous uh, drawings, I guess. Yeah. Elizabeth is asking us, can one consider the elegance and elaborateness of the clothing and the coffers in Veronese's scenes, a somewhat Venetian characteristic? Oh, yes, somehow it is. Uh, there are other yeah, as well, you know, it's, uh, yeah. yeah. Somehow there are other painters that actually paint like him uh, in, in Venice for sure. But uh, what is particularly striking for Veronese is that he used like this kind of very, very um, uh, cold and uh, bright color that are very, very different. And also the materiality, the way that he's able to, um, to, 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 to represent the tactile of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the clothes and the dresses is definitely Venetian, because it's something that actually belongs also to Titian and to other Venetian artists. But um, in some ways, it's, it's also clearly, especially in, in his early career, is clearly connected to, more, to a central uh, Italian um, pattern as well. Yeah, by the way, the next uh, webinar on um, September 8th will be yeah. by Giorgio Tagliaferro will, will focus on the relation between uh, yeah, exactly. Raphael and Sorry, Titian. So this, this will be for sure one of the topics. Um, and then we have one, one more. Alice is asking, which of the Veronese quality are present? Realism, ornamentation, or theatrically? And why? Oh, wow. Uh... You know, theatrically, I would say that it's mostly compositionally and it's mostly the, the way he designs. Uh, realism, it's, um, it's definitely important. Um, the, the richness, the elaborate, it, the, the point, the problem is that we keep, we stuck keep saying that Veronese was like a, a great decorator. It was the wonderful colors and that's it. It was actually way more than that. It was like um, very, a, a, a careful designer, a proper designer. So I would say that it's more like both theatrically and composition, to me, at least. Nathan is asking, what are your thoughts about Veronese anachronism, especially in the feast at the House of Levy? Which is quite... The anachronism in the feast yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh gosh. This is a big, this is a big subject. There is a, a whole book <laughs> on the anachronism now, on the Renaissance. Uh, it's absolutely... Um, right, it's complicated. Can we just, thanks Nathan, it's a great question. But <laughs> can we have another seminar for that? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yes, it's anachronistic, but it's also uh, totally contemporary. Those are the kind of scene of punkers that you, you would have seen probably in Venice, like wearing like this kind of clothes and rich clothes and elaborated clothes and uh, also the way they were serving and the, um, mm, the objects and the dishes, everything was like absolutely um, contemporary. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, just, it's, a, it's a tough question. Yeah, and either one would be of the love of Veronese for uh, pets and uh, dogs and appears so often so often in, in, in his, his uh, paintings, yeah. big paintings. Yeah, they're yeah, populated true. with different figures, including pets and, and dogs and, and, uh, and so on. I was particularly struck by that, which I think it's a quite typical story for the Renaissance. Uh, the way, I mean, the fact that follow Danae from Rafa's uh, drawings into a Christian representation and becoming, I mean, being used, I mean, the same, the same patterns being used for a Christian, total Christian and, and um, a devotional uh, painting uh, by Veronese, yeah. which uh, is, was quite common. I mean, also for Veronese, yeah, it was common. Classical and patterns and 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 uh, and uh, subjects for uh, adapted. Yeah, painting. absolutely. Well, there is a um, there was a drawing that I haven't show here, and where it was made in probably around 1568 by Veronese, where there is um, a, a figure sketched. Um, which is clearly recalled the statue, the sculpture of the Vener Venus Pudica. And so it's the typical uh, Venus that actually is covering her breasts and um, her, uh, mm, her sex, and actually her period. And um, that 
uh, drawing was used uh, several times towards uh, Veronese's career to um, to draw to and adapted to different uh, uh, subjects, religious and also uh, mythological. So, for example, it was adapted to the figure of Mary Magdalene, the, pen the penitent Magdalene, on one hand, and also later in his career to a mythological an allegorical picture to represent an allegorical figure that was actually close to uh, mm, the, the idea of the sapienza. So, uh, yeah, it's something that was absolutely normal, common, and something that also Raphael did, and, but many others have done. Have done. Beautiful. We have many questions. That's really great. And, and uh, you. whenever our listeners say, or viewers say, thank you and grazie, congratulations, compliments. Oh, and uh, Alex is reminding us that uh, recent lecture at the Institute, Raphael, the making of a master, looked at the aspect of the, of the connection, Raphael and Leonardo. And uh, there are several comments on the fact that uh, imitation, imitatio, is a form, normal function in all the arts. Raffaello from Leonardo and, and others. Yeah, it's, a, it's also a rhetorical point. It's imitatio, emulatio, and superatio. It's based on rhetorical things and it's also a concept that uh, we have been, keep, we kept using like um, following Vasari. That actually, the, the Vasari's life are based on, on this idea of uh, imitating like the previous masters, emulating, so like, like actually basically peer them and then superate them. So in a, an idea of progressive art, um, which is actually something that the current uh, scholarship is quite keen to, 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 to revise and to revise and to see, to, to, pl to place in a different perspective. And I will say there's plenty of right. And about Raphael and Leonardo, sure, I'm sure that there is, um, that there are so many possible potential um, point of contact. Um, the most important thing is try to remember is the, it's especially when he's in Florence that actually it's able to, to actually to, to see, to, to, to talk to him and to probably to know, to get to know him. So it's in his Florentine years that um, Raphael actually approaches Leonardo. But then again, even later in Rome, he approaches him again. So uh, yes, kept studying Leonardo for sure. Oh, well, here we have another question. So by Bogna Public, what was the impact of the investigation by the Holy Inquisition of the of the feast in the house of Levy. <laughs> oh well, <clears throat> that's so. Um, the the feast in the house of Levy actually the the, uh, the title was changed uh, because um, apparently, according to the uh, the verbal of the uh, of the trial, that Veronese was like actually called to to um, to to reply. Um, to, to, to present, like, is to defend himself. Uh, well, if you have to believe that that is actually, uh, actually really happened, um, it's, a, it's a bit weird, it's, weird. it's, a, weird, it's a strange document. Um, but yes, basically, the, result, the final result was that to change the title from the simple Last Supper to call it, like, uh, 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 mm, the, the, the last supper, the feast in the house of Levy, and that's why he signed it with the Levy and, and the 1573. But yes, the impact, I don't know, from a historical point of view, it's probably the highlight of Paolo Veronese's career. As I said, he had a very, very boring career. I mean, it was a very, boring, a very normal life. It was like absolutely a, 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 a very nice person, um, always like um, punctual in his commissions, never had any problem. He married the, the daughter of his master. He had like several children. He trained them, and at some point he died. He, he wasn't like a crazy guy. He wasn't like Caravaggio or... Yeah, we all have in mind Caravaggio always. So no, exactly. Yeah, the exactly. The romantic approach of the art to the art. Yeah, exactly. So the idea of the, of the process in, of the Inquisition, somehow it's something that actually has helped in making like Veronese's figure more romantic, as you can exactly say. Uh, so the impact, I guess, that is mostly for, for us, is, 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 is in our perception that we have. Uh, yeah, that is kind of huge impact. And um, we have another question from J.J. Jones. Uh, <laughs> why do you think he changed his style, color palette, and uh, as he aged? His last supper is so vibrant, fresh. Thank you. Yeah. 
um, yeah, this is the kind of the canonical uh, explanation is that everyone, you know, every artist, if you look at, if you, if you read any book on an artist based again on the Vasarian approach and, and, and more romantic approach, you, uh, you realize, you notice that uh, every, everyone starts with like um, having a master, then becoming better than the master, than their own teacher. Um, then having like uh, reaching the, 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 the fame and being famous and then getting old and starting getting a workshop and they're, they, they, uh, they're getting old so they start like painting like in a more um, dark way in a deeper way and they have like workshop around so it lo they lo lose of quality and then the, the artist died. Um, this is a kind of common pattern, pattern to, for all the artists. Uh, it's not necessarily always the same. Uh, there are many reasons also uh, in terms of the context, historical context. We are talking about uh, um, the style that was changing and probably um, all, it's, it's the same for all the artists in, in Venice around that year, around that, eight, that years. And we cannot even talk for Veronese as, about, as a late style because Veronese died when he was like at, at, his peak, at the peak of his career, when he was in his 60s. Titian in his 60s painted the Poesie and then he lived other 20 years. Um, so mm, it, it wasn't like, um, the, it's just a matter of fact, like the, just simply aging is way more complicated than that. About aging, I'm sure next uh, webinar yeah. by Giorgio and Titian on uh, yeah, exactly. Titian, we'll, be, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll touch upon this because I mean, the, we know how Tiziano cha dramatically changes his, his painting yep. uh, style. And, uh, there is a question regarding the Veronese's des um, designs in the Villa Barbaro. And the question is, were those his own thoughts or did, he, did the patron have design input? Input. Uh, you, you, you probably mean then in, in terms of uh, iconography, I guess. Yeah. I no, guess. definitely uh, there was uh, a, a project uh, or a design behind. Uh, the point is that we don't know even what the, 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 the paintings actually means. And there is a huge debate. And um, there is clearly, uh, well, the, the Barbaro were an uh, important family and they have like, um, they were humanists and were connected with like uh, a circle, um, a group of um, humanists with um, deep interests also in astronomy and um and other sciences so it's definitely something that has to be i never studied it like in in, in depth to be honest but um even if i started studying that I, i'm not sure that i would come to an end unless you don't <laughs> to a final conclusion unless you don't find like the proper tests that actually explain you everything it's what happened with the famous villa caprarola for example for the um for Zuccari. it's again a, a villa which like outside rome and he's decorated with all this important and very interesting, very intriguing um, frescoes and paintings that actually have always had like incredible tones of interpretation by art historians until when we finally found uh, a document that actually is the, uh, the plan, the iconographic plan written by, not by the painter, but by the, uh, an advisor of the, of the, of the patron, of the patron, and that's it. So that's probably the, the thing that's more realistic. Yeah. Okay, we have more questions, but I think we are uh, we should uh, approach <laughs> the, the end. The I end. think we had yeah. Thank you again, Thomas. I would love also to I I would like to apologize for the fact for the for the problems we had with uh, with the audio. So Ooh. the sound was uh, a little bit um, I'm sorry. coming and going. It's, um, as I said, we had a test a couple of days ago and everything went well. Then technology helps a lot and sometimes fails. So when it fails, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, but okay. But I hope it, it wasn't uh, harm to, to understanding and it was still possible to follow the, I'm sure it was, because I, if I can judge from the, from the questions we had, I mean, they're all very, to the point. So I'm, I'm glad we had such an attentive audience. I'm very happy. I would like to, to thank again all the colleagues in North America and the different institutes uh, um, in, Ch in Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, Montreal, New York, uh, San Francisco and Washington DC uh, that helped us uh, here in Toronto to put up this uh, webinar. 
thank you so much, Thomas, for this beautiful. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, yeah, it was really great to to have you with us and to have this connection with uh, the National Gallery in London. Of course, we all would love to come to to travel now to Italy and to the Uffizi, yeah. to, yeah. to the Galleria dell'Accademia in Venice. Uh, yeah. Don't <laughs> we visit you in London at the National Gallery, which is not really possible at the moment, but we all hope. I mean, that's uh, it will, these difficult times will be over soon, and we will still again be able to see in, to, to be in front of these magnificent paintings Maybe. by Raphael and by and by Veronese, and of course to be in Venice to visit the churches like the Chiesa di San Sebastiano and so many other churches with incredible Veronese paintings. Yeah, I hope that I made you travel a bit, at least with your fantasy, at least with your mind and through my definitely, definitely. So I hope so. And I like be. always, art, the enjoyment of art is a great uh, consolation in this uh, always in difficult time. This time, so, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, next uh, webinar will be um, on September eighth. Uh, Giorgio Tagliafiero from the uh, a Venetian scholar, but uh, teaching now at uh, University of Warwick speaking about um, Raffaello and Tizian. So we have a small series of sort of Veneto-based or Venetian-based webinars. Amazing. Thank you again. This, this webinar will be, has been recorded and it will be shortly in the next few days, will probably early next week, will be available on the, on the YouTube channel of the Istituto Italiano di Cultura. So feel free to, to tell your friends to go and watch it. So Thank you again, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks.